The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello there, everyone. This is Karen Campbell. I am the Assistant Director for NAPSA, and I'm very excited to welcome you all to today's webinar hosted by the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Today's topic is related to funding in Adult Protective Services. And before we launch into introducing speakers and uh, more about the topic, I'm going to hand things over to Andy with the APS TARP uh, to talk a little bit about their work. Thank you, Karen. My name is Andy Capehart. I'm with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center here at WRMA, and we have a quick disclaimer before we get started. The APS TARC is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated, and the contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. So, uh, next slide. And just a little bit about our APS TARC. We're here, we're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. There'll be some contact info displayed at the end of the webinar, or you can just Google us by APS TARC, T-A-R-C. Um, so we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Uh, next slide. And then we'd like to make a quick shameless plug for our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three peer-to-peer -peer calls each month um, for APS workers, APS supervisors, and APS administrators, respectively. Uh, you can see the schedule here on your screen. If you would like to register for these calls and you're an APS professional, just reach out to us. You can um, visit our webpage and click on the peer support link for details, or you can email us, which again, uh, that email address will be displayed at the end of the webinar. So, um, and now Karen, I will turn things back over to you. All right, thanks, Andy. So before getting started, we do have a few just housekeeping tech kind of points. Um, so you all know this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online later on. Um, to connect to the audio, if you're having any trouble, um, you can connect via either telephone by choosing, um, you'll have on that little side panel on the right that pops up when you get into the webinar software. There should be a little drop down that's labeled audio. And there is an option for telephone, and that'll give you instructions for what number to call in and how to enter the access code, et cetera. Or you can choose mic and speakers to just use the microphone on your computer. Um, and you don't have to worry about that speakers part because everyone, um, all participants are muted for the duration of the webinar, which leads me to my next point. If you have any questions as we're moving through the presentation, um, if you have like tech related questions, please feel free to write them into the questions box that is also located in that right hand panel that would have popped up when you got into the software. Um, it's just called questions. You can write in uh, right there and we will see that we'll be monitoring them throughout. Um, any questions related to webinar content, we're going to save up until the end of the presentation, and then those will be read aloud for the presenters to answer for everyone at the end. And also, um, if you would like to look at a copy of the slides in a kind of handout version while we're going through the presentation, they are accessible to you during the presentation um, on the, again, that right hand panel in the handout section. And so one more thing before we launch into content, we do have a poll for you all um, to get a better idea of who our audience is here today. So uh, the poll question will be, which of the following do you identify the most with? And then it lists out various uh, professional fields. So Andy, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and launching that poll question. Certainly. <laughs> I've launched that now and people can vote by clicking directly on your screen to let us know which of these apply most to you. And we'll leave this open for about a minute or so to give people a chance to respond. And again, this is just what you feel, which category you feel, um, you know, identifies your profession the best. So this helps us get an idea for who the folks are that are on the webinar and who our audience is. 
minutes. So we'll let this go for about another 15 seconds as the votes are rolling in. Again, you can just click on your screen to vote. All right, so I will close that poll out now and share the results for everybody to look at. Karen, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, wonderful, thank you. And thank you all so much for uh, responding to that poll. All right. And now I will introduce our speakers for today. Um, so we have three speakers with us and we are very excited to hear from them. Uh, first, we have Bill Benson, who is the National Policy Advisor with the National Adult Protective Services Association. And we also have um, Jennifer Sperry, who is the Director of Older Adult Protective Services with the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, and Jennifer Mays, who is the Victim Support Program Supervisor with the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging. Um, so, we're very excited to have them presenting with us today. Thank you in advance, Bill and the Jennifers, and I will pass the microphone to you now, Bill. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Andy, for getting us established here today. So, uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start with just a little bit about NAPSA, the National Adult Protective Services Association, which was formed in 1989 as a national association for state and local adult protective services professionals. NAPSA works to strengthen APS through education, research, and advocacy. And NAPSA is also home to NEFI, or the National Institute on Elder Financial Exploitation, which among other things hosts the annual World Elder Abuse Awareness Day event in Washington, D.C. in June. Uh, NIFI also hosts a financial exploitation summit, which always takes place immediately following NAPSA's annual elder abuse conference. Next slide, please. We thought it would be useful just to remind us all about NAPSA's um, Code of Ethics for Adult Protective Services, the guiding value of APS, that every action taken by APS must balance the duty to protect the safety of the vulnerable adult with the adult's right to self-determination. And next you see on this slide, the principles of APS, that adults have the right to be safe. Adults retain all their civil and constitutional rights. Adults have the right to make decisions that do not conform with societal norms, as long as these decisions do not harm others. And adults have the right to accept or refuse services. Next slide. I will provide an overview of several funding sources for adult protective services, including social services block grant and Medicaid administrative claiming, but will provide a more in-depth look at Victims of Crime Act funding, or VOCA, as this is a relatively new and a significant source being tapped by some APS programs. I will then turn it over to Jennifer Sperry and Jennifer Mays who will provide insights into the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging's success in obtaining VOCA funding in Pennsylvania and their insights into what this new funding source means to their program, their Adult Protective Services program in Philadelphia. Next slide. Generally, these are the categories of funding that are available to Adult Protective Services, the Social Services Block Grant, Medicaid Administrative Claiming, Victims of Crime Act or VOCA funds, state and local tax dollars, and that's usually in the form of state general revenue, uh, as well as local general revenue, but it also includes on a limited basis, local property tax levies. Ohio, for example, has pioneered the use of local tax levy money uh, for aging services, including APS. And as I understand it, most recently, uh, the city and county of San Francisco passed their uh, so-called Dignity Act, which provides local tax-based funding for aging services, including APS. And then there's a catch-all other category, uh, which for example, would include um, discretionary grants, such as those provided by the Administration for Community Living. I, I will not today get into uh, discussion about state and local tax dollars or the other sources beyond SSBG, Medicaid Administrative Planning, and VOCA funding, but our, our primary focus in this conversation will be on VOCA. Um, we may, NAPSA may host a future webinar 
to discuss state and local tax dollars as a funding source and perhaps get into more detail at some point about some of the others like Medicaid administrative claiming. Next slide. I'm going to say a little bit about social services block grant. This is uh, the only source of federal funding that is devoted to adult protective services in terms of states can devote these funds to their APS program. It's a critically important um, source of funding for APS in many states, and it remains the number one priority for a ANAPSA in terms of its advocacy, and that is to make sure that we continue to have the SSBG program. It is administered by the Department of Health and Human Services through the Administration for Children and Families through their Office of Community Services. Under SSBG, states can choose any or more of 29 services uh, to fund with their allotment of SSBG funds. Therefore, APS is one of those 29 services. For fiscal year 2017, the most recent data that we have available from HHS, 35 states have opted to use SSBG funding as well as the District of Columbia and three territories uh, for APS services for a combined total among all those jurisdictions of just over $214 million. Um, you will see here the states as well as the District of Columbia and the territories that have that are reporting or reported in fiscal year 2017 that they used SSBG funding for adult protective services. Um, if you go to the ACF website that's listed below on this slide, you will find under the Office of Community Services the annual reports for SSBG up through 2017. For those states and territories, if anyone's from one of the territories on this call, these are the states that report using SSBG for APS. Well, you may want to see if the amounts that are reported are consistent with your understanding about your state's SSBG expenditures. We have heard from APS administrators um, who have said that the amounts reported to ACF by their state don't always jive with what they understand to be the funding they're receiving through SSBG. So, it would be worth looking at these documents just to see if the, uh, the funds that are reported as being spent are those that you uh, understand them to be spent. Um, I will mention uh, two other points that uh, the amount of the number of states that use SSBG and the amount does fluctuate from year to year because it's completely dependent on states. The 214 million in FY 2017 is pretty close to the high water mark that we've seen over the last number of years. I will also mention that the president's budget um, that was just released uh, again calls for elimination of SSBG, uh, but we're pretty confident that that in the final analysis uh, won't happen. Next slide, please. I'm now going to turn to Medicaid administrative claiming. I'm just going to say a few words about it this time. As I mentioned earlier, we will likely include it in a future NAPSA webinar to go into more detail about Medicaid administrative claiming as well as state and local uh, uh, taxes that are used for APS programs. Medicaid reimburses states for certain administrative activities for Medicaid clients. Each state or agency, um, such as the Medicaid agency, develops a cost allocation plan for federal approval through the Division of Cost Allocation, or DCA, which is located at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, on how the state will access Medicaid and other federal funds for these activities. The Medicaid program reimburses the state 50% of the cost of the eligible activities since they are classified as administrator acti administrative activities. Next slide. Certain activities performed on behalf of Medicaid clients are reimbursable under Medicaid administrative claiming if the Adult Protective Services Program is included in the state's federal cost allocation plan and if the APS program has the infrastructure and processes in place to collect the information necessary to meet federal requirements for reimbursement under Medicaid administrative claiming. Next slide. Administrative claiming activities that can be reimbursed include, for example, those related to eligibility determination and referral and coordination. 
Uh, incidentally, all of the activities involved in APS investigations of allegations of abuse involving providers of Medicaid services are reimbursable. Thus, if you were investigating uh, reports of abuse by uh, providers of home care services under Medicaid, uh, those could be entirely um, uh, uh, reimbursed for your activities doing those kinds of investigations. Next slide. If you are interested, if a state is interested in seeking Medicaid administrative claiming payments, APS administrators need to identify who is responsible for development of the state's Medicaid and or other cost allocation plan and discuss uh, including APS in that. And generally, this is going to be someone in the finance office of the state Medicaid office. If, if however, other programs within the same agency as APS use Medicaid funding, so if you're in an umbrella agency with different um, administrative units and others are using Medicaid funding, uh, then the, the agency's budget office should be able to assist you. As we noted in a 2015 NAPSA publication about uh, Medicaid administrative claiming and VOCA funding, um, and this was developed uh, uh, thanks to Carl Urban, uh, who at the time was um, still with the Texas APS program, to be reimbursed under Medicaid administrative claiming, an a APS program has to be able to collect data on each variable in a way that is acceptable to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, certain Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, and the Division of Cost Allocation. Having the administrative infrastructure necessary to collect the data, for example, to conduct random motion trial studies, time studies, uh, or RMTS, may be a significant barrier for some APS programs. The state's Medicaid cost allocation plan, which must be approved by CMS and DCA, explains the state's methodology. Uh, we will provide a copy of the 2015 document to anyone who would like it. Um, it provides links to um, other very detailed documents from the federal government that, that go into this relative, fairly complex um, area. So now I'm going to shift to the next slide, which is uh, to begin the discussion about the Victims of Crime Act funding. And this sets the stage, of course, for hearing from our friends from Philadelphia, uh, the two Jennifers, who will talk about their experience with VOCA funding, their successes with it. The Victims of Crime Act, or VOCA, was first enacted in 1984. It provides the primary federal support for programs serving victims of crime. Um, a small percentage of funding is used at the federal level. Uh, this provides funding for some discretionary grants that are provided by the Office of Victims of Crime at the Department of Justice, pays for victim witness coordinators, FBI victim specialists, and includes a tribal set-aside for American Indian tribes and Alaska Native uh, villages. Um, the bulk of the funding is distributed out through formulas in the form of state support uh, for two programs, the Victim Compensation Programs and the Victim Assistance Programs. Both are uh, provided to states through formula grants. The Victims of Crime Act, FOCA, established the Crime Victims Fund from which these funds that are used for states are provided. And the Crime Victims Fund is funded by criminal fines, forfeited bail bonds, penalties, and special assessments. And these are funds that are collected by the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the U.S. Courts, and the Bureau of Prisons. The, um, the money is not subject to annual appropriations. There is this fund. There's no taxpayer dollars in it. As I mentioned, it comes from these fines and penalties and other assessments. Um, the Congress decides how much of that fund will be made available. And because the amount of funding that goes into the overall pot fluctuates from year to year, depending on the amount of criminal fines or penalties or special assessments that are collected. So Congress tries to project to, uh, out ahead um, to make sure that the fund retains you know, money for the future. So the amount that's made available does fluctuate from year to year. That's a congressional decision. Um, Several years ago, there was a very substantial increase in the amount that was allowed to be released for 
uh, used by the Department of Justice to send out in these grants to states. Uh, for the current fiscal year, the amount of money nationwide that is available is $2.64 billion, but it was $3.5 billion in FY19, so that's a substantial reduction, and that's due because of the decisions about managing the overall fund um, uh, at, at the congressional level. Uh, but we've come a long way since FY14 when it was $745 million million dollars. The high water mark was $4.4 billion in FY18. So we've seen a significant reduction, which means the competition for those dollars is certainly more intense um, as there's uh, reductions in those funding out there. And we, of course, hope that that fund will grow and more money will be available in future years. Next slide. The funding that's provided to states it goes to two programs, the Crime Victim Compensation Program, which is formula grants to states for reimbursing victims of crimes for their out-of-pocket expenses that result from that crime. And the second large program is the Victim Assistance Program grants. And these are formula grants to states for grants that are awarded by the state for victim assistance programs, including adult protective services. And that, of course, is what um, uh, the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging has been successful in obtaining. This money can be used for such things as funding intake units, funding for specialized programs, uh, for entering into uh, memorandums of understanding with non-APS programs that are receiving VOCA funds, funds so that APS can use some of those funds, and there are many other possibilities. Next slide. A report about abuse, a report made to adult protective services does not need to be made to law enforcement. A report can be made to adult protective services to establish eligibility for an individual as a victim of a crime. Um, these fundings fund direct services uh, for crime victims regardless of the victim's participation in the criminal justice process. So they don't have to have gone to law enforcement. There does not have to be a finding of a crime by a law enforcement or um, a prosecutorial entity. And finally, eligibility is not dependent on immigration status. So there's a great deal of flexibility in terms of its availability uh, for serving victims of crime. Uh, there are some, certainly some challenges with using these VOCA funds. Uh, for example, state VOCA grants may require a match. Um, a lot of discretion at the state level of VOCA funding. If they do require a match, it's possible that a waiver can be obtained through the state. The, that's a truly a state-by-state -state decision. Um, or you could create an agreement with an outside organization receiving a grant so that you could be uh, a recipient of those funds through some other grantee that is currently receiving them. Um, next slide, please. For victim compensation, again, this is, re this is actual reimbursement to victims of crime. Uh, it's a different program, but it's, it's um, funded uh, two states, and states are responsible for administering it. Um, provides uh, for reimbursement or compensation for a range of costs that are incurred by the victim, um, ranging from immediate emotional, psychological, and physical health and safety, through such means as emergency food, clothing, shelter, and transportation, short-term in-home care and supervision of uh, services in a home, in, in a person's home when the offender or caregiver is removed, or short-term stays in a nursing home or adult foster care, or group home placement for adults for whom no other safe short-term residence is available for such things as eyeglasses and prosthetics, can be used to reimburse for personal advocacy and emotional support, mental health counseling and care, and a number of other services. Next slide. Um, peer support, uh, facilitation of participation in the criminal justice system and other public proceedings arising from the crime, legal assistance. And I might note there, as just an aside, legal assistance, legal services are also very explicitly uh, eligible for receiving 
uh, VOCA funding to provide legal assistance to elder victims of crime. Um, forensic medical exams and interviews, transportation, public awareness, transitional housing, and relocations of victims. These are all um, uh, services or, or needs that can be compensated uh, through VOCA. Um, so I think with that, I'm now going to hand the, uh, the baton over to Jen Speary and Jen Mays from the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, who actually are using VOCA funds and um, can share with us their very practical, hands-on experience and insights with this important source of funding. Uh, Jen and Jen, all yours. Thanks, Bill. Um, this is Jennifer Sperry. I'm the Director of Older Adult Protective Services. And when we first heard about the VOCA grant, we thought, oh, you can do next slide, please. We, um, we thought, well, who doesn't need more staff? Who doesn't need more funding in APS? I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way that are on this call. But what we um, really thought of was, what does our department need? And we needed support for the protective services, we call them consumers in Pennsylvania, post-investigation. And um, that means after we've substantiated the case. What I'd first like to explain is in PCA in, within Pennsylvania, our criteria as every state's criteria is different. So in Pennsylvania, we're a bifurcated system. So there's 18 to 59, and then there's 60 plus. And we are an older adult protective services organization. And our criteria is the person is in, within the county that you're working in, over 60 years old, lacking a responsible caregiver, at imminent risk, and incapacitated by something, not incapacitated by the guardianship standard. So just to give you a little baseline on where we're coming from in Pennsylvania, because every state is indeed different. So we um, really wanted to be able to give these cases that we substantiated the time and energy that they deserve because you know, poly victimization is ever present. These cases are getting more and more complicated. I always joke with Jennifer that more we learn, the more complicated things get because you can address more. But this uh, dedicated victim support coordinator, it's a unit of four coordinators and then Jen's the supervisor. And they really provide the older adults with assistance to different appointments. And I'm gonna let Jen go into all of that legal proceedings. They give them the emotional support and guidance and really help them hopefully prevent the re-victimization and restore them to their pre-victimization state. So um, next slide, please. We took a leap of faith and we really jumped in and applied for this grant because the motivation was there when we saw our numbers increasing and our staff wasn't. Um, the funding and increasing the services and resources available was, was number one. The needs of the older adult victims are unable to be fully met given the current limited funding that we're receiving. Uh, we wanted to establish a team of coordinators that would be able to dedicate the additional time needed to manage these complex cases and the needs of the older adult victims. And um, an additional, we added an entire team of four coordinators and a supervisor to our department within PCA to manage some of these most more complex and time intensive cases. And we really wanted to specialize in the victim-focused care planning. And we found there's a lot of training that's provided by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. That's who's our state administrator for VOCA funding. They're actually coming to our staff meeting this Thursday to present on the victims, the, the VCAP funding reimbursement. And um, the, the victim service coordinators also attend trainings that are provided through PCCD, there's a foundational academy they had to attend, but also our, our monitoring agency, the Pennsylvania Department of Aging um, and the Temple Institute on PF provide training. So the, the VOCA team, the victim support program is a part of our APS program. Next slide. So we um, assist Philadelphia residents over 60 who are a victim of abuse neglect or financial exploitation. And we use that word victim throughout our grant because you know a lot of us use consumer or client or older adult, but really focusing on the victim because that's we are a victim service provider. The main objective was really to address and eliminate, reduce, eliminate and or reduce the abuse, neglect, exploitation that they experienced while responding to their emotional and physical needs. Because if we need to, we need to do a complete care plan, not just respond to the one 
allegation that came in, we want to really prevent them from coming back in because the recidivism can really grow quickly. The program really works to prevent that re-victimization by connecting the victims to support after the imminent threat is eliminated or reduced. Next slide. And a lot of the grant that I'll go into in the next slide after this is about our partners in the city. The um, PCCD, the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, really likes to see partners and other victim service providers work together so, you know, everybody's not doing the same thing independent of each other. You know, utilize the resources as effective as possible. So um, our program really provides the victim with that necessary emotional support and guidance and transportation so that they understand that stabilizing their life is indeed possible and achievable. And we do work with our partners within the city. We're lucky enough to have Senior Law Center and CARI, the Center for Advocacy and Rights of the Indigent and Elderly. But they, um, they all have programs too, so we're communicating with them to ensure that we're working together and not in silos. So ultimately the goal of our program is to restore them, the victim to their pre-victimization state maximize their level of health, independence, and productivity, and improve their overall quality of life, and hopefully keep them out of APS. <laughs> Next slide. So challenges about to applying for the funding. Well, the application was huge, and um, we were lucky enough to have staff here at PCA that assisted. We had a, a planning staff person who is experienced in grant writing, and a fiscal person. And I'd say if you have a fiscal person, that's the key part. That was my weakness. But you know, you can throw your ideas down on the page and I would just recommend just jump it in there and write what you need. All of us need something across the country. And uh, the grant requested, you know, county statistics and demographics, uh, diversity and inclusion was really important. They wanna see that we're reaching out to people who might not have immigration status, reaching out to non-English speaking older adults or people that um, need American Sign Language disabled. And um, our partners really, so the hatching of the idea is what I mean by really just throwing your ideas down on paper and really focus on what you need and what your goals of the program are. And um, obviously adherence to the VOCA standards and that's where the grant here through PCCD asked for letters of support from our partner agencies, and we're lucky through our task forces. We have the Philadelphia Financial Exploitation Prevention Task Force, which was most of our partners from that force really wrote letters of support, you know, Carry and Senior Law and the DA and bank financial institutions here. And um, Joe Snyder, who some of you may know, still leads that. I'll give a shout out to Joe because he's probably listening. But uh, so our partners really wrote letters of support and um, also there's a hoarding task force that we had some partners from and outreaches are also a valued and and um, important part of the grant and that's part of the VOCA standard in the grant is that we will do outreaches and Jen has done several throughout the city just to let other agencies know that our program exists but you have to go through older adult protective services. And that, that's a challenge that's not on this slide, is that some of our partnering agencies said, oh, how can I refer to the victim service program, support program? And I said, you can't refer to the victim support program. You have to refer to older adult protective services. And then if we figure out that it, this person's an older adult in need of protective services, the case can be transferred to the victim support program. Because naturally not every substantiated case ends up on Jen's team because she doesn't have but four victim service coordinators, victim support coordinators. So we used a lot of language in the grant to ensure that the scope of the project was manageable for our agency. We used a lot of language about um, expanding and enhancing our already existing services while maintaining our core direct services, increasing the diversity and scope of services and continuing to provide for the underserved and unserved victim populations. And um, like I said, determining our partners and supporting agencies was key because really this, this application for the funding focused on underserved and, um, you know, it, including minorities and including disabled people and really just reaching out to, to people that you couldn't find in the city. So next slide. More challenges, and I've, I learned a lot through this process, really, because part of the grant said you need to have a volunteer. 
and um, or volunteers. And the board of directors was initially thought, oh, we, they're volunteers, we could use them. But then there were training requirements for that. So we ended up using student interns and we actually have an investigator here that is working on his master's and he was able to do his internship through the victim support program. So there's our volunteer. So you just have to think creatively here. <laughs> and the subcontractors, a lot of that subcontractor information had to be put in the grant to prove that we posted RFPs for our interpreting services, as an example, our nationality service. And they just wanted to make sure everything is done fair and consistent with our subcontractors. The data collection and reporting requirements, I should have Jen speak to this because she's managing a lot of that, but it's it's been a learning curve, but we do have to say PCCD has been very receptive and supportive and understanding about us learning how to navigate e-grants and the efforts to outcome ETO system, and that's where we report. And um, the systems themselves aren't bad, it's just learning the new systems. So, um, Understanding the VOCA allowable direct services, that was interesting with the grant. And that's where our fiscal person really came in handy because she has applied for grants in the past. And she learned things that, you know, we could include office supplies in our grants, in our grants, but not rent because we own the building here. And so we were going to charge the victim support program rent, but that was not allowed because we own the, build, own the building. But um, again, the VOCA people are very, very accessible and answer questions really timely, either by, by email or phone. So I would say initially, oh, and the reimbur it is a reimbursement system here. I'm not sure how other states might go, but you know we have to put the money out and then we're reimbursed. So we submit quarterly reports for the reimbursement. And there's two separate reports. One is the client side, the victim side, and the other is the fiscal side. So I would say initially I was hesitant and a little nervous about the grant writing, but my advice is just to jump in, write down what you need and why, keep the focus on victim services to diverse underserved populations, which we know are a lot of APS clients. And um, I did write a lot, of, a lot about isolation in our grant because that can really make somebody very vulnerable. And um, you just have to go for it. I, I don't know, that's my advice, but our, at the end of this is all of our information. So I would say just reach out to us if you have any questions at all. But at this point, I'll hand the webinar over to Jennifer Mays, the supervisor of our victim support program. Take it away, Jen. All right, hi everybody. I'm gonna first talk about how the uh, VOCA funding is utilized here in uh, Older Adult Protective Services at PCA. So there are a number of things that we utilize our funds for. The um, first would be individual advocacy, which is something that um, is offered and presented for each of our um, victims. Um, where I would say that that's the majority of, of what we do um, is individual advocacy. We assist our victims in, with making reports to law enforcement. I'm sorry, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, so like I said, individual advocacy reports to law enforcement. We assist and attend meeting with legal service providers when appropriate. We make referrals with the, the victims um, to legal service providers. We provide accompaniment to and from court with ongoing support throughout the entire process. Some of the court proceedings that we assist our victims with are protection from abuse order hearings, landlord tenant court, uh, orphans court, which includes guardianship hearings, and any civil court proceedings that are um, associated with the crime in which the uh, older adult victim needs assistance. Next slide, please. Again, um, some more uses for the funding here at PCA is communication, meeting, and completing documents with financial institutions. Our victims often need assistance with reading and completing some of those documents and then transportation actually to the bank 
um, and assistance and support, perhaps with speaking with um, representatives from those financial financial institutions. Sometimes it's a matter of our coordinators just assisting with making those telephone calls, perhaps from the home or the bedside of the victim um, to call the bank and to stay on hold and assist them uh, with getting um, to the correct person. Accompaniment to and from the hospital or medical provider for medical or forensic evaluations. Sometimes it's a matter of, um, you know, just assisting them to get to their regular primary provider um, or they may need more emergent care at a hospital uh, emergency department. We do safety planning and crisis intervention to provide stability and security. We offer interpretation services for our older adult victims. We do follow-up after court hearings, hospital and medical evaluations. We also do referrals for ongoing counseling to restore emotional security and well-being. Next slide, please. We make referrals to programs to provide social support to reduce isolation, like Jen had said earlier, with our older adult victims, isolation here in the city of Philadelphia, we know is a major issue for our older adults. We provide emergency financial assistance to assist with emergency shelter, food, transportation costs. Um, shelter and food are an increasing use of our funds here within the department. Um, we're utilizing things like uh, grocery delivery services um, and then emergency shelter. We don't have true emergency housing here in the city. So the use of hotels, motels, things like that, uh, we're able to absorb those costs outside of the um, protective services funding. Um, the VOCA funding comes is a, is a big help for these older adult victims. We provide collaboration with victim advocacy agencies throughout the city and we make referrals to um, and or assistance with the enrollment of home and community-based services. So once we are able to eliminate or reduce an imminent risk, um, we know that these um, older adult victims are in need of ongoing services. Uh, they don't have the family or the social supports to assist with that. So we are um, finding ourselves needing to assist with those ongoing services. We provide assistance with alternative housing and living situations. Next slide, please. We make referrals. We assist with um, touring, uh, maybe some long-term care facilities. We assist with applications and transfer into boarding homes uh, emergency shelter and personal care homes when that is appropriate. Um, we assist and facilitate with the completion of a victim impact statement, which is um, a part of the uh, VOCA grant that, you know, once you apply and are accepted for a grant, you'll certainly hear more about the victim impact statements. Um, some of the chat, next slide, please. Some of the challenges that are associated with VOCA grant funding that we've found here um, in our funding is that all staff included in the VOCA grant funding must attend all the PCCD training, which Jen had um, mentioned earlier. Now, with protective services, we have our own set of training, which our team is also attends and completes. But then as part of the VOCA grant, there is additional training, uh, one of which is a foundational academy. And it's a three day long training that provides a large amount of information um, specific to uh, VOCA and um, victim 
advocacy, um, basic compensation, which is done online, but is a significant amount of time that goes into that training, and then ongoing yearly training requirements specific to PCCD and the VOCA grant. Um, the next challenge was utilizing the ETO software, like Jen talked about earlier. It's not um, overly complicated, it's just um, learning a new system and we're actually um, getting an updated training coming up soon um, where uh, PCCD is able to come here to PCA and provide that training to the entire uh, VOCA team, which we are really looking forward to. Um, we need to submit quarterly reports, including the ETO reports that I run, and then they are um, inputted into the eGrants um, software, and then they are sent um, into PCCD to be submitted um, for our VOCA funding. And then we also need to submit timesheets as part of the VOCA grant, which is outside of uh, what we do here at PCA. Um, so I do some of those and then Jen Sperry does some of those and they're submitted to our fiscal department who then forwards those on um, to PCCD for the rest of our funding. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, um, as we prepare to um, re-up our VOCA uh, grant, we are looking forward to reapplying for another grant. Uh, we plan to include some additional funding areas. Every time a new um, subject comes up, Jen and I kind of jot it down as, as new information to be included in our new grant application. So one of the things that we plan to include is on-call staff for our VOCA-specific consumers or victims. As you all know, in APS, it's a 24-7 um, department, and uh, we're hoping to include uh, VOCA staff to handle uh, calls that come in from our VOCA-specific uh, victims in our next grant. Uh, we'd like to include two additional victim service coordinators, so to increase it to six VSCs and including myself in the next grant. Additional funding for training and continued education. Our current investigators, I'm sorry, our current uh, coordinators really value the education um, that they've received thus far and we're always looking into additional um, education and support for them. We'd like to look at including personal care services and home delivered meals into the VOCA, into our next uh, VOCA funding grant. Um, those are huge costs um, for our victims here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, looking ahead, we'd also, next slide please. We plan to remove certain ancillary staff funding from this upcoming VOCA grant application in an effort to streamline reporting and ease the timesheet submissions. These staff from our IT department were written into the grant for a minimal amount of hours per week. The amount of time that these staff provide to the VOCA funded staff exceeds the amount of time it takes to meet the reporting requirements. So what we found is that the amount of time that it's taking to actually document um, some of these staff members, such as those from the, our IT department, um, the cost benefit um, is, is probably more, more beneficial to us to actually write them out of our next grant. So that's just one of the things that we found um, within the grant that we thought was going to be beneficial and it ends up that it's probably better that we not include them the next time. So that's all that I have for our VOCA grant. Next slide, please. 
All right. Thank you all so much for that presentation. And we did have quite a few questions come in throughout. So I'm going to I'm going to get through as many as we can. Um, so the first question that came in, it came in while Bell, uh, while Bill was speaking to the Medicaid administrative claiming. And the question is, is there a place to find whether your state is already seeking reimbursement? Uh, I think I, I think probably the best way to do that, uh, from my, you know, from what I know, is to go to the um, the finance office or the budget office within your agency or within the Medicaid agency to figure out if um, administrative claiming is being uh, applied for for the APS program. I, I think that's your best bet is to do it internally within the state um, state government. Um, I'm not sure it's possible that that information is available through um, uh, uh, through the, the state, uh, through the federal government, uh, namely through probably through the um, through CMS. But I think that would be much more difficult. I would my advice would be to try and do that internally. Um, we to anybody who wants it, we will send out the document from 2015 that NAPS have put together that addresses both uh, Medicaid administrative claiming funding as well as VOCA and there are within that there are several links to um, um, key federal documents from both CMS and HHS and the Office of Management and Budget uh, that deal with administrative claiming. It is it's pretty arcane I have to say um, you know it, it may be less so for somebody who's got a real uh, fiscal eye which I do not have but um, um, I would I would start first with your budget office and work your way through your budget and fiscal folks uh, to figure that one out. Wonderful, thank you, Bill. The next question that came in um, is it says my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that the VOCA funding has been cut dramatically and therefore may severely limit um, what has been more and more useful to APS in recent years. Can you comment? Uh, I guess I guess I'll I'll take that uh, for now, and maybe the gens will have something to add to that. Yes, as I actually noted in my comments earlier, the the amount of money has been reduced um, in in the last couple of fiscal years substantially, and again that has all to do with how much money Congress decides to take out of the VOCA fund to make available um, as they try to manage. Uh, the fluctuation of the amount of money that's paid into the fund from fines and penalties and uh, assessments. And, um, I, you know, if, if we go through some lean years of no major multi-billion dollar um, or many, many millions of dollars of, of fines and penalties, it's going to affect that fund. So so the, the upshot has been a, a, a significant reduction over the last several years. Um, although I, I do want to say that we, we, we jumped from 2014, it was $745 million, uh, and we're presently at over $2 billion in the fund. So it is a significant amount over FY14, but it certainly is substantially less than an FY19. Um, uh, and, you know, we don't know what we will have in FY21, but um, it's likely to not be a significant increase, uh, if at all. And maybe even a further reduction. The president's budget would reduce it slightly. Um, um, slightly, that's relative by 300 million dollars. And and all that is to say that yes, that is going to make um, the competition for those funds, you know, uh, more challenging within a state. Uh, from the standpoint that um, you you have a number of victim service providers that have been getting grants for many years. Um, you know, so they, they've had the money and in many respects and for APS and for elder victim services more broadly, whether it's through legal assistance for the elderly or some other entity, including APS, uh, we're the new kids on the block, we're the newcomers. And so breaking in is certainly going to be a challenge if that's not been provided in the past. But at the same time, uh, the, 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 the optimist in me, um, says that the, the 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 emphasis on trying to serve the needs of elder victims is a new one. Um, even though it's been allowable in the VOCA Act for many, many years, it was not clear. And so in, in 2015, I believe, uh, the, um, the federal government clarified through um, 
uh, administrative means, they clarified that this really does include elders. Uh, uh, elders are also victims of crime. And so I think it's, in many states, it remains unplowed ground. And even though the dollars are less, um, this is a significant population that needs to be served. And if it's not being served in your state, and the odds are pretty good that they're not being served through VOCA funding, um, you know, hopefully you can make the case even with reduced overall funding to the state for VOCA. Uh, but I don't want to sugarcoat it. Um, those reductions certainly um, make it more challenging to tap into it as opposed to those several years where we had a surge of new money. And we certainly hope to see a surge of new money uh, in, in future years. All right, thank you, Bill. The next question was, um, when it says public awareness is considered to be a fundable, to considered to be fundable under VOCA victims compensation, does that mean that an entity would be able to use funds from VOCA to run a public awareness campaign? I think uh, I'd like to, um, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I, is that something that you've encountered in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania with your a state VOCA um, agency. Uh, I, I asked that of our, our PCA colleagues. It, it was part of our grant because they are very in tune with us getting out there to let others know that the program exists, but it's not like we bill the grant to get reimbursed for that, but it's certainly a part of it. They, they want to see that you're doing outreaches and public awareness. Does that answer the question? Jen, it's, it's, it's part of what you do under the grant, but it's not one of the things that you get reimbursed for specifically. Right. Okay. right. But it was clearly stated in the grant that they want to see that. <laughs> and presumably that helps to, um, I hate to use the word, but helps to generate um, uh, victims coming to you uh, yeah. through that outreach it, so that, that you have victims who then for whom you serve, you can then get the reimbursement for the services that you do provide that are reimbursable. Yes, it's, uh, what we have found is um, getting the word out to different agencies so that they know that we, we exist and that our services are available through Older Adult Protective Services. I think the, the relationship building is huge too, because you spoke earlier about the limited amount of funding and some level of competition, but if you get to know your other victim service providers, there can be planning around it so that you're providing different kinds of services to different kinds of victims and not all working in the same, you know, fighting needlessly, if that makes sense. All right, great, thank you. So we are coming close to time, um, and I do wanna be mindful of that for folks. Um, so I will, I'll have Frida one more question, if that's all right with the presenters, and then I will show the contact information for our presenters today and, and for the TARC. So the last question for today, um, it's a question for Jennifer Mays. What have been the outcomes from this program? Um, specifically recidivism, client healing and satisfaction, etc. Thank you for the question. Um, that is something that we're measuring constantly. Um, and I think we're going to need some more time with our program to have definitive answers on outcomes. Uh, thus far, the consumers or the victims that we have serviced have not had any recidivism yet for those who we have closed. Uh, we've served approximately 200 victims so far, and our goal, our, one of our major goals, like we said, is to decrease recidivism and we are making um, really good strides in that in that area 
Um, like I said, I, I think we're going to need a little more time to um, establish um, concrete numbers, um, but it, it is definitely something that we are um, hopeful is, is going to continue um, to show really positive strides um, that, you know, the time that's being put in to assist our victims is is decreasing isolation, recidivism, um, and the impact um, that the crimes have had on, on our older adult victims. And anecdotally, she's had some really great success stories, but you know, the, the reality is when you don't see them again, I count that as a su success <laughs> on some level. Agreed. <laughs> so great. there's our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us. All right, great. Thank you all um, so much for presenting. This was wonderful and helpful information. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, and on this next slide here, we do have contact information as well for the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. Um, so it has an email there for their info, and then also it has their website displayed. So thank you all again, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>